It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My first question this morning is to the Premier. This morning, Toronto Public Health issued an alert about two confirmed cases of measles in Toronto. Can the Premier provide an update on the nature of these cases and how the government is responding? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. That is correct. Toronto Public Health did issue an advisory this morning indicating that they are investigating two lab-confirmed cases of measles in adults that are travel-related. Uh, Toronto Public Health is following up on all known contacts who may have been exposed. The intent will be to those who may have been at Pearson or in the hospital during those times to be aware that they may have been exposed to measles. And Toronto Public Health is working with the Ministry, Public Health Ontario, and the Public Health Agency of Canada to make sure that people are informed and they are tested and uh, treated appropriately. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, this alert from Toronto Public Health comes on the heels of a study from Public Health Ontario that raises concerns about the number of Ontario children who have not been vaccinated for measles. A lack of vaccination of the kind provided by public health units has been cited as one of the reasons for recent outbreaks in the U.S. Investments in public health are more important than ever. Speaker, Can the Premier tell us how Ontario is dealing with the threat of measles in light of his government's funding cuts to public health? Questions been referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, measles outbreaks are very rare in Ontario due to high vaccination rates, but of course we need to continue to be vigilant on that count. We have been advising people for months that they need to be vaccinated. That is something that Toronto Health Public Health will continue to do, as will the public health units across the rest of the province. We are confident that with the arrangements that have been made for the next few years with respect to funding to public health units, that they will continue to focus on the most important issues in public health. Vaccination rates are one of the most important issues. Making sure that they continue with uh, ch children's breakfast programs and others are also important programs, and making sure that children with special needs are supported. But I am confident with that, with the funding they will be receiving, that they will be able to focus on and continue with those Response. very important programs. Final supplementary. So, in effect, Speaker, it's a just trust us answer. The last time this government was in office, this party was in office, people couldn't trust that they were making the right priorities uh, uh, at the front of the uh, agenda. Speaker, vigilance requires resources. That's the bottom line. Families worried about their health and the health of their children are coming to appreciate the importance of vaccinations and the important work that public health units do. In light of measles and public health challenges, is the Premier willing? to reconsider his significant cuts to public health. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and through you, I would like to say it is very concerning to me that the official opposition would use this case to raise unnecessarily alarm bells and to scare people. There's what we want to there. do is to make sure Order. that people focus on the issues that are most important on public health. We were elected in order to be careful stewards of public funds. We would expect that the municipalities would do the same. I am confident that Toronto Public Health is focusing on this measles outbreak. It does happen from time to time, but again, I am confident that with the money they will be receiving over the next few years, that if they focus on priorities, and vaccination is certainly one of them, that we will be able to contain this and make sure that people receive the vaccinations that they receive now and into the future. That is a role. That is what they should be doing. That is Response. what they are doing. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, to the Premier, but I have to say those who don't remember their history are destined to repeat it, and that will hurt Ontario families. The Mayor of Ottawa is the latest municipal leader asking the, the Premier for order. some reprieve from his retroactive cuts to everything from public health to flood prevention. But side, come to order. On Friday, he asked the Ford government—this, by the way, is the mayor of Ottawa. I'm not sure if people could hear coming from the noise on the other side of the, uh, of the chamber. But on Friday, the mayor of Ottawa asked the Ford government to, at the very least, give municipalities some time to implement the cuts, which were imposed retroactively. Speaker, Is the premier unwilling to do that? 
Questions to the Premier? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we have great representation up in Ottawa. We have great ministers up in Ottawa. Matter of fact, if you look at the jurisdiction, we have more ministers in the Ottawa area than anywhere in Ontario. We have a great relationship with the, the mayor in Ottawa. We have open conversations. We talk frequently, myself, not to mention the ministers, I uh, talk to him all, all the time. He was quite pleased to accept the over a billion dollars, one point, I think $1.2 billion for transit. Uh, we, we've supported uh, that area as much or more than any other area in all of Ontario. So he's quite pleased with our performance, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, Ottawa is not the only city asking the Premier to rethink uh, his cuts to programs and services that families rely on. The City of Toronto has pegged the Ford government's cuts at $178 million for this year alone, retroactive. That's $24 million cut from transit, meaning more delays on the TTC. That's $65 million cut from Toronto Public Health, making it harder for them to respond to events like measles outbreaks. And that's $85 million cut from childcare, putting over 6,000 childcare subsidies in jeopardy. Order. How can the Premier justify cuts to programs and services that are going to hurt his own constituents? Premier. It looks like, uh, looks like the City of Toronto is using the same calculator that the opposition is. And, you know, let, let, let me uh, just, just remind the, the Leader of the Opposition and maybe the City of Toronto, they're saying we cut $24 million in, in transit? you got to be kidding. We put over $20 billion Billy. we took off their books. That's with a B. Billy. $20 billion off their books for backlog repair for transit. We're investing $28.5 billion in transit. vast majority are going in Toronto, getting people from point A to point B in a lot rap more rapid fashion. And as for Toronto Health, you know something? I sat down there for years, and it's just a bastion of lefties that sit on that committee. Matter of fact, we put them there, and guess what? Mayor Tory took the same strategy we did. Put all the lefties in one corner in Toronto Health. They come up, they, they, they say they can't find savings in 2011. We Spons. asked them to find 10 percent. They found it overnight. But going out and spending money, just absolutely ridiculous uh, amounts of money, that well, watering tree stumps, stumps is one, but having a competition for packages. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. People deserve so much better than this, Speaker. The Ford government cuts to municipalities are going to hit families hard. That's the facts. If the, if the Premier wants to pretend that operating and capital costs are the same thing, that's his decision to make. But whether these uh, governments, whether the municipalities rely on school breakfast programs, child care, or they're counting on the province to help mitigate flooding, Order. municipal leaders across this province have asked the Ford government to sit down to discuss the impacts that the cuts are definitely going to have on families in their constituencies. And the Premier's response is to sit in the legislature the other day reading from his itinerary, itinerary that his staff produced for him. People deserve a lot better than that, Speaker. Will the Premier start doing his job and listen to these municipal leaders? Premier. Well, I'm, I'm glad the leader of the uh, opposition— I'm glad the Leader of the Opposition, her last word were jobs. We created 47,000 jobs, unprecedented in Ontario last month. Mr. Speaker, we've created 175,000 jobs. That's 111 months. That's 175,000 families are able to put food on their table, able to pay a mortgage, able to get out there and feel great about themselves because of our government. Our government created the environment to create 175,000 jobs for 11 months, Mr. Speaker. All we've heard is the opposition's increased taxes, increased spending. Do they even understand how the system works, Mr. Speaker? Do they believe in just continuously spending us more into bankruptcy, other than what we've already we already uh, came in here with a bankrupt province? But we're turning Response. it around, Mr. Speaker, through the great budget through our finance minister. We found a savings of 8 percent. We're putting money back into the taxpayer's pocket instead of the government's pocket. But the NDP, all they want to do is spend the Thank you. Money. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Later today, we're going to be debating a resolution to officially declare a climate, climate emergency in Ontario. We know that uh, naming and uh, framing this issue is the first step to taking real action to mitigate the disastrous effects of climate change that we're seeing unfold against our prov uh, around our province. Will the Premier support our motion to de declare a climate emergency in Ontario, Speaker? Premier. Minister of Environment. The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, um, on behalf of the government, we look forward to debating that motion. We look forward to an opportunity to speak about our Made in Ontario plan. Uh, we also look forward to our ability to talk about what we've done for Ontarians in terms of eliminating programs that weren't working, programs like the cap-and-trade program of the previous government. We put $260 back into the pockets of, uh, of Ontarians by eliminating that program and have presented a program that will meet our targets of reducing greenhouse gas by 30 per cent. So, Mr. Speaker, we look forward to the debate. We look forward to talking about this important issue, and we look forward to uh, hearing the new ideas that the Leader of the Opposition will bring to the table wow. about her plan for, uh, for fighting climate change. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has admitted that the government believes climate change is real and that the flooding we're seeing across Ontario is likely one of the effects of it. Uh, what this resolution does is affirm our commitment as legislators to act in the best interests of Ontarians to take decisive steps to fight against climate change. So if the government already believes climate change is, a, is a, an issue and it's a real issue, will they stand with us this afternoon and support our resolution? It's a simple qu question. I'd ask for an answer. Questions and refer to the Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I don't want to spoil the surprise, so I'm going to make the uh, I'm going to make the honourable member wait for the debate. But 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 in addition to our our, our plan around uh, around how to support uh, support the fight against climate change, we are also supporting Ontarians by fighting Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. And I know that the leader of the opposition, being a member from Hamilton, will be concerned because she likes to talk about health care, about the 2.1 million dollars that Justin Trudeau's carbon tax is going to cost the Hamilton Health Sciences Corporation, or the 696 thousand dollars that Justin Trudeau's carbon tax is going to cost St. Joseph's health care. So, in addition to fighting climate change, in addition to, uh, to making sure we do what's best for the environment, we're also going to do best for things like health care. So I guess the question back to the member from Hamilton is, is, are they going to be supporting Justin Trudeau's approach, or are they going to come with their own ideas? The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. For several weeks, we have dealt with flooding in communities across the province, and it is having profound impact on many Ontarians as high water levels put people and properties at risk while disrupting businesses and the economy. Thankfully, our Premier has been demonstrating strong leadership and is active decisive. Active, uh, acting decisive, decisively by meeting with our municipal partners to determine what can be done to prepare for future flood events. Last week, the Premier committed to a task force to look at opportunities for watershed management in the Muskoka and Ottawa regions that can be applied to watersheds throughout the province. Can the Premier update the, the House on what progress has been made? Questions to the Premier. Well, I want to thank the, the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. What an incredible member. We were up there not too long ago. Another loved MPP, part of our caucus. And we have been, uh, we've been up in Ottawa, we've been all over Muskoka, it's actually over in Muskoka again uh, uh, this weekend looking at uh, the, the flooding area. First of all, my heart goes out to every single person dealing with this flooding disaster, because that's what it really is. It's flooding into their homes. And again, once again, I want to thank the communities for helping out, but I also want to thank our Canadian military. They're absolute champions. I mentioned we'd put a task force together not, not much longer than a week ago. Uh, we've already assembled a task force uh, headed up by the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, which is doing a great job, uh, not only in the Muskoka area, but the Ottawa region, any other regions that have been flooding, flooded, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government for the people are taking this situation seriously. Response. And, I've, and again, when, we, when we're up there visiting it, Rather than just sitting back here and talking about it or criticizing it like the opposition, 
We're in. We're in there. We're in the communities talking to the people. Our <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Premier. Supplementary question. Thank you for the Premier for the response. Mr. Speaker, I am looking at the my I'm sure that my constituents and Ontarians everywhere will be reassured with how seriously our government and our Premier are taking the situation. I know that the Premier has been working hard alongside the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and the Solicitor General, and we as we respond to the situation on the ground. I also want to thank the volunteers first responders and the Canadian military who have come together to help all those impacted by the flooding. This continues to be a trying time, but together we will get through this. Speaker, can the Premier provide us further details on the task force on watershed management? Once again, the question is to the Premier. Well, again, I, I want to thank our all-star MPP. All Working, well, we got tons of all-stars. Unfortunately, <laughs> you don't have the same. <laughs> As, as, you know something, as, 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 Mr. Speaker, are you done? Okay, good. Okay, as I've said previously, we've reached out to municipal leaders, asking for their input, asking them to put people on the task force. So we're holding sessions. We're holding sessions, and hopefully the NDP won't get their union buddies to protest these sessions like they do every other place we go. We're holding sessions in Muskoka on May the 17th, in Pembroke on May the 23rd, and in Ottawa, May the 24th. We're there to listen. We're there to support these communities. We're there to put resources into the communities and help rebuild their homes, Response. rebuild the businesses, and get it back to normal and prevent this from ever happening again. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, three of the Premier's members, the member for Niagara West, the member for Brantford Brant, and the member for Scarborough Centre, all spoke at a rally against reproductive rights held on the lawn of Queen's Park. In his remarks, the member for Niagara West said, and I quote, we pledge to make abortion unthinkable in our lifetime. The Premier was given the opportunity in the legislature to distance himself from these comments. Instead, he deferred the question to the Minister of Energy who inexplicably talked about the federal carbon tax. The Premier has another chance today, and it's important that the answer come from him. Will he say that he refutes his MPP's comments and supports a woman's right to choose? The question is to the Premier. Well, well, through you, Mr. Speaker, we have a big tent here, and I don't dictate to anyone what their beliefs are. We are not, I'm going to repeat, we are not reopening any abortion issues here in this legislature. It's very simple. Can any of my members speak their mind? Yeah, they can speak their mind. Because not everyone in this legislature thinks the same. But I'll tell you what we do think the same. We think the same when it comes to cutting taxes, respecting the taxpayers, creating jobs, lowering energy costs. Order. That's what we believe in, Mr. Speaker. But I'll be very clear again, we're not reopening anything. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier needs to be very clear here. We know that women across Canada have fought hard for their rights to their own bodies. And the remarks made by these three members of his team are a direct threat to those rights. We also know that the Premier is making sweeping cuts to Ontario's health care system that could impact women's reproductive rights. Do the remarks made by the member for Niagara West reflect the priorities of this government, and will Ontarians see any changes to abortion services in Ontario? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. 
appreciate the opportunity to respond to this. This Progressive Conservative Party is a big tent, but let me be perfectly clear to echo what the Premier of Ontario has said. This party, this government will not be reopening the abortion debate. This member right here stood in support of the bubble zone in Ottawa to protect women's right to choose. This government will continue to stand up for Order. women's rights across this province, despite the rhetoric from the members opposite. Order. But if the members opposite think that we should have an homogenous thought process within the government as we represent 73 different ridings across this great province, they must think again. We respect the, de the debate internally within our caucus, but let me be perfectly clear. This party, this government, Response. that premier will continue to stand for women's rights across this province, and we will not be reopening the abortion debate. Stop the clock again. Order. 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 Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Burlington. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Our government came into office on a commitment to create an environment where businesses can thrive and create great jobs. Because we know that businesses thrive, people thrive. And when people thrive, communities thrive. Our plan is working. Last month, Ontario led the ways um, with the most uh, Canada-posted uh, record jobs growth. 47,000 jobs in April, more than any other province in this country. Fantastic. And it's going to keep growing. More people are working in Ontario than ever before, which means more people have the opportunity to thrive and get ahead. And I know these job gains are in large part thanks to the policies our government has pursued since taking office. Speaker, could the minister please outline for the House how we are making Ontario an engine for job creation? Great question. The minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Burlington, our outstanding member from Burlington, who does such a great job at promoting job growth in her riding. So far this year, Ontario has created 115,000 jobs. That's on top of the 47,000 jobs that were created last month. That's over half of the jobs created in Canada in 2019. We're leading the way because of our open for business policies that we've been able to implement here in the early days of our government in Ontario. Cutting red Red tape, making sure we're cutting taxes, starting to deal with the Liberals' electricity mess, Mr. Speaker. They want to invest. Job creators want to invest. They want to create jobs here in Ontario, and they understand that in Ontario we have a premier and we have a government who understands exactly that. That's getting out of the way of government and ensuring that they have the environment where they can create jobs. Our Response. 2019 budget introduced new measures to support our job creators like the Ontario Job Creation Investment Incentive, which has also been a huge hit for job creators. We're just getting started, Mr. Speaker. More jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you so much, Minister, for that response. You sure can argue the facts here. I know my constituents are excited that Ontario's economy is booming. People are coming back into the labour force. Workers and families who gave up after 15 years of Liberal mismanagement are seeing opportunity again. We promise to create an environment where businesses can grow, thrive, and create good jobs, and we are doing exactly that. I know the Premier, the Minister and our entire team have been working to make Ontario a better place to invest, and when companies invest, they hire more people. From our auto plan to making it easier to hire apprentices to the Ontario Job Creation Investment Incentive and cutting red tape, we are in introducing policy after policy aimed at creating good jobs. Could the minister outline for the House the importance of continuing to create good jobs for the good people of Ontario? Minister. Speaker, I just want to make it abundantly clear. In the calendar year 2019, Ontario has created 115,000 jobs. Since we've been the government of Ontario, 175,000 wow. jobs, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. We're doing it, though. 
Mr. Speaker, we're doing it in spite of what's happening on Parliament Hill with the federal government. They're implementing a carbon tax in spite of their tax hikes and in spite of their failure to resolve the steel and aluminum tariff situation that we find ourselves in, Mr. Speaker. We're doing everything we can in Ontario to ensure that Ontario is open for business. I've been crisscrossing this province, as has been the, uh, the Premier as well, and I can tell you that people from Windsor to Brockville and all points in between, they want good jobs. And every step of the way, Mr. Speaker, whether it was cancelling the Liberals' costly cap-and-trade system Response. or reducing the over-regulation that the Liberals piled on us or closing the skills gap, the NDP have fought us every step of the way, Mr. Speaker. Why won't they get on board and help us create jobs? In Thank you. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Restart the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The estimates came out last week, and it shows this government is gutting the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services by nearly $900 million for this year alone. Okay. But what it doesn't show is the Premier's promised $600 million for the revamping of the Ontario Autism Program. Will the Premier explain why he's decided to backtrack on the promise to properly fund the Ontario Autism Program? Questions to the Premier. Uh, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Minister of Children, Much, uh, Community Premier, and Social Services. I appreciate Services. the opportunity to respond. As the member opposite would know, uh, not only did we invest $1.2 billion extra in health care, $700 million more in education, but also $300 additional million dollars in the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. What wasn't in the estimates, because the enhancements were made after the document was prepared, is the additional $300 million that we're adding on top of the $321 million that has already been committed by our government. I'll be pleased to talk a little bit more about it in the supplemental, but make no mistake, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services has one in ten Ontarians who rely on this ministry. They range from children in custody to children in care, those with developmental disabilities and autism, people on social assistance, whether that's Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Supports, it's women fleeing domestic violence and sex trafficking, and it is veterans who rely on us for a second hand up. So, Speaker, we'll always continue to defend the people who rely on this ministry, and we'll continue to defend the people of the province of Ontario. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier, but what I have to say to the Minister is every group that she just named is part of the vulnerable sector that this government has attacked, that we have seen in this past budget. <laughs> Speaker, families with children with autism are upset. Their childhood budgets are not flowing. The telephone town halls are frustrating, and PC members are refusing to hold roundtables. The estimates show that the promised new funding for the Ontario Autism Program does not exist. Why will, will the Premier not deliver on the promise to families of children living with autism? Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. Well, the telephone town halls have been very well attended across this great province. Yeah. MPPs, I know a member of her own caucus, uh, Catherine Fife, shared with me a roundtable discussion with her just last week. Happy to include that. I spoke with the Minister of Community and, uh, of Government Services, who's hosting a roundtable himself. Very pleased that this is happening right across the province, but make no mistake, we have over 500 letters have gone out for the childhood budgets. We are Order. moving people off of the wait list and into service, service by the way, which they have more choice. Order than ever before, and as we do this, Speaker, we are investing in an additional $300 million for a needs-based program. The spend for this program in Ontario Autism will be the biggest spend of its kind in the history of this province, in the history of this government, and we're going to continue to consult with experts, and I'll be releasing the expert panel uh, later on, either this week or early next Response. week. But let me be perfectly clear. The opposition continues to sow the seeds of division, and I think that it's time that we started working together, and I've invited them to do that. Order. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la solliciteur générale. Late last year, the, the solliciteur général 
is unconstitutional because it violates Section 12 of the Charter. It is a cruel and unusual treatment. While Ontario's average prison population has decreased over the last 10 years, more and more people are put in segregation. The vast majority of them are in administrative segregation, not disciplinary, and there's no legislative limit to the length of their stay. Many are on suicide watch or suffer from mental health. There was a bill uh, proposed by the uh, former government that was introduced and passed by this House, which would bring necessary amendments that are necessary to limit solitary confinement. Speaker, since last June, the bill has been collecting dust. It's not been enforced, and I'm asking the minister today, can she tell us when she's going to implement the bill to ensure that Ontario complies with its constitutional obligations? The question is to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I understand that the member opposite has a particular interest in this file, as do I, as Solicitor General. And, uh, but I think that she's taking a very narrow view of the issue. You know, we have an obligation, and, and to your credit, you did raise it in your question, where uh, less than 5% of the individuals who are currently in segregation are actually there because of a disciplinary matter. In fact, many ask for it because they are, um, they are concerned about their safety. And we need to make sure that correctional officers and staff have a number of tools available to them. Uh, this is partly about ensuring the safety of our staff, but also, frankly, ensuring uh, that we don't have an increased incident of inmate-on-inmate uh, inmate, um, uh, interactions. I want to make sure that the changes that we make Response. are going to be positive for both the correction staff as well as the uh, individuals serving in our institution, and I will work with my ministry to make sure that happens. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. This afternoon, I will be tabling a bill that seeks to end the, the practice within five years, but in a context of obviously wanting to protect inmates and guards similarly. So I think, Mr. Speaker, I want to make sure that we are responding adequately to the Court of Appeal decision. I think it is important to all of us, not just me, that we comply with the Charter. And I, my, uh, my interest here is simply to ensure that promptly the government ref uh, deals with this question so that we are in compliance with, with the Constitution. Can the minister indicate whether she's prepared to act on this file quickly and maybe take some lessons or some ideas from my private member's bill? <laughs> Minister, Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, and while I'm I'm interested in reading the uh, member opposite's private member's bill, I want to assure the members of the House and the people of Ontario that we are already making some proactive changes that are improving safety and security in our corrections facilities. Uh, it was uh, less than a month ago that uh, my friend and colleague, the um, uh, we we were able to announce in Thunder Bay that we are going ahead, moving ahead with the new uh, corrections facility in Thunder Bay, which will lead. Thank you. Now, the, uh, the investments that the Minister of Infrastructure and I are making will lead to safer jails, will lead to stronger and safer uh, work environments for our corrections officers. I want to make sure that as we are making these investments, we are doing it in a measured and reasonable Response. way. Uh, one of those changes was clearly the uh, investment in Thunder Bay, and there will be more in the months ahead. Thank you, Speaker. The next question. The member for Sarnia Lambton. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Recently, the Minister of Transportation tabled a comprehensive bill with a number of measures that, if passed, will cut red tape, reduce burden, and make our roads, bridges, and highways safer for everyone. This past Friday, I was pleased to join the minister in a very important announcement about our highways. Our government's number one priority is keeping the people of Ontario safe, whether it be at home, work, or during their commute. That's why we are working to ensure the people of Ontario have a safe and efficient highway network. In the mid-1970s, posted speeds on our provincial freeways were reduced 
in response to the energy crisis. Most provincial highways have a design speed of 20 kilometres an hour above the posted speed limit. Speaker, can the minister share with the legislature the important announcement he recently delivered for improving Ontario's highways? Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and thank the member from Sarnia-Lambton for that great question. And it's right, just last week I was in the Sar our Delaware region of the province uh, with a member from Sarnia-Lambton, Bobby Bailey, as, as well as road safety partners Elliot Silverstein from the CAA and South Central Ontario and Brian Patterson from, from the Ontario Safety League. We were pleased to announce that the government is moving forward with a pilot program to explore the new way of improving our transportation network by increasing the speed limits to 110 kilometers an hour on select highways. We'll be utilizing Highway 402 from London to Sarnia, the QEW from St. Catharines to Hamilton, and Highway 417 from Ottawa to the Ontario-Quebec border. Public safety on our roads and highways is, of course, our number one priority. That's why we're taking the time to prepare the pilot locations to begin in mid-September, and the pilot will be conducted safely and for over two years. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to uh, speaking more on this in my supplemental. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you to the Minister of Transportation for sharing the details of our government's new speed pilot. Our government is acting fast to improve, expand, build new public transit and invest in making our roads and highways more efficient and safer. We know that when get, we get communities moving, people will have access to new jobs and new opportunities. It's part of our plan to ensure that our transportation system works for the people of Ontario. In southwestern Ontario, we know that our provincial highways, especially the 401 and 402, are both gateways to our U.S. markets. Highway 402 is especially important for commuters going to London and people visiting friends and family in Sarnia-Lampton. Highway 402 is also vital for large and small businesses exporting products to Michigan and the states beyond. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share more about the need for this pilot and to get the people of this province moving? Minister. Thanks again uh, to the member from Sarnia Lampton for that question. And as I mentioned earlier, the pilot is going to run for two years and we are going to monitor its effectiveness. Our government believes that increasing speed limits will bring posted limits in line in other jurisdictions and how people are currently driving. The pilot is the first step as we move forward to gather information for a permanent decision. We are launching province-wide public consultations in the next few weeks that will be part of our final decision-making process. And we will be engaging our enforcement and road safety partners every step of the way to ensure that our highways continue to be ranked among the safest in North America. This pilot, along with our consultations, will allow the province to monitor changes in average speed, traffic volumes, and other factors to determine the effects of an increased posted speed limit in these pilot areas. Mr. Speaker, our government is focused on safety. Our government's focused on getting people moving, and that's what we're going to do. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We've all heard that famous quote that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats the most vulnerable members. Speaker, I believe that to be true. So, when this Conservative government rips $900 million from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, I think it's evident to Ontarians across the province that this government is doing irreparable damage to our society. Children, People with disabilities, those living in poverty, they are the ones that will suffer the most. How can the Premier possibly justify these cold-hearted cuts? Why is the Premier targeting the most vulnerable people in Ontario? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Children, Community, Social Services. Minister the Minister of Children, Community, and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. As I mentioned to uh, the response to her colleague, the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services is actually increasing its budget this year by an additional $300 million. She doesn't have to take my word for it. She can actually look and read the estimates. In addition to that, we know that the, the uh, members opposite tried to suggest that we're cutting education when the Minister of Education is investing an additional $700 million into our education system. They try to suggest that we're cutting money from public health and health care when we know the Minister of Health is investing an extra $1.2 billion into health. Now, these don't fit the narrative of what the government or the members opposite want, but we were very clear in our budget 
In our message to Ontarians, we are protecting what matters most to Ontarians, and that means we want to end hall hallway health care. That's why we want to invest in students and yeah. schools, and that's why we want to have a sustainable social assistance program to support children with autism, to support children in custody, to support children in care, and to ensure women escaping violence and sex abuse are protected. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I actually did look at the estimates. Perhaps the minister should too, because the Conservative government's estimates revealed a lot in terms of what they value and what they don't. The Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services was cut by $900 million. The Ontario Disability Support Program was cut by $222 million. Ontario Works was cut by $300 million, and the Family Responsibility Offices was cut by $3.3 million. That office, that cut, hurts mostly women and children. Yep. If the Premier took time to listen to Ontarians impacted by these cuts, and the Minister, frankly, what they'd hear is the overwhelming fear and anxiety about the future from people in this province. Does the Premier understand that he is putting people's lives and livelihoods in jeopardy with these callous cuts? Questions been referred to the Minister. Members, please take their seats. To the Minister of Children, Community and Social There's Services. a fundamental difference between us in the government and them in the uh, in official opposition. There's a difference between Fair. us appreciating the fact that we have Ask the opposition to come to order. Same rule applies. I have to be able to hear the member who has the floor. Order. Order. The minister. The minister of finance and the treasury board president made sure that we had a budget that protects what matters most. The minister responsible for economic development has been able to announce 116,000 to new jobs. What does that mean, Speaker? It means more people in Ontario, a social assistance, are eligible for employment. That means they're moving off of the rolls. Unfortunately, the members opposite would rather have people rely on a government check than the dignity of a job. I have said repeatedly in this House, and I remain steadfast, the best social program is a job. This government Spons. will continue to fight for that, and that's why we created 116,000 new jobs since January alone. We'll continue to create an environment where we will lift the bar. Order. 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 Start the clock. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Our Indigenous peoples play an important role in creating a strong and enriched province. This is especially true in Northern Ontario. Our government is focused on creating economic opportunities for Indigenous peoples all over Ontario. We are already making progress, Mr. Speaker, and the mining sector has responded by investing again in this province. The mining sector is the, th the largest private sector employer of Indigenous peoples, and we are excited for the new projects that we will create great new jobs. Can the minister please tell us more about how, how our government is making a real difference for Indigenous peoples in the province? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Perry Sound Muskoka and the extraordinary work that he does for his constituents. Mr. Speaker, we're very pleased to have had the opportunity to move forward on some initiatives that were long overdue to move forward with for the benefit of Indigenous communities across this province. We move forward with the implementation of indexing the pensions for uh, Grassy Narrows and Wabsimum First Nations people suffering from mercury contamination. We implemented, Mr. Speaker, the English and Wabagoon Remediation Trust. The Indigenous this internship program, Mr. Speaker, will start this summer to give Indigenous youth an extraordinary opportunity. We understand their challenges, Mr. Speaker, but their opportunities. The Williams Treaty, I was joined by the member of Simcoe North and Northumberland Peter 
Borough South for a long overdue signing uh, of this treaty, Mr. Speaker. The Six Nations, the Anishinaabe Nation, <laughs> Anishinaabe Aski Nation have all held receptions here, Mr. Speaker, to build powerful relationships with this government, Mr. Speaker, and in fact, all members Response. of this place. We're proud of that record, Mr. Speaker, and we know there's more work to be done, and we're working on it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for being a strong advocate for Indigenous peoples in caucus and in the Legislature. Mr. Speaker, everyone in this House is aware of the challenges Kashechewan First Nation faces every year. Each spring, when the ice melts near this northern community, families are forced to evacuate their homes in fear of flooding. Rising water le levels have been threatening this community for far too long, Mr. Speaker. Our government has acted quickly to help the people of Kesheshawan evacuate, but that's not good enough, Mr. Speaker. The families of Kesheshawan deserve a place to build new roots, a place that's safe for future generations. Can the minister please tell the members of this House about a recent announcement that is finally going to provide Kesheshawan First Nation with a long-term solution? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pumushe mitadu. In just under 10 days, Mr. Speaker, as uh, Chief Friday from Kisechuan said in his own language, uh, we mobilized the resources and the leadership of the leader from Kisechuan First Nations, Chiefs of Ontario Grand Chief Roseanne Archibald, and Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler from Anishinaabe Aski Nation, Mr. Speaker, to move forward not just with an agreement, an agreement that had not served, or agreements that had not served. Kasachuan fairly over the years, Mr. Speaker. Efforts had been made, documents had, be, had been signed. Some efforts, Mr. Speaker, to move that community to higher ground had little or no effect. And here we were 15 years later, Mr. Speaker. I had visited the community in my previous role as a member of provincial parliament and was plenty familiar with this, Mr. Speaker. We Response. signed a framework agreement that is a work plan summary that is going to move that community, Mr. Speaker, in the coming years. We're proud of our accomplishments and we thank the leadership of the community and other leadership from Indigenous organizations for the important Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the government released more details about their cuts to the programs and services that families rely on. On the chopping block is the OPP, who will see their budget. This question is for the Premier. On the chopping block is the OPP, who will see their budget slashed over $46 million this year. One of the vital public safety services the OPP provides is to keep drivers safe on our provincial highways, but the government has just announced it is considering increasing speeds on those very highways while cutting the OPP's budget. Why is the Premier asking police officers to do more with less? And look to the Deputy Premier. To the Solicitor General. Referred to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, when the NDP are trying to suggest that three, three pilot projects across Ontario are in some way going to be devastating impacts for the people of Ontario when all we are talking about is three pilot projects of 110 kilometers an hour. I have trouble with that, Speaker. You know, we have, we have excellent OPP officers in this, in this province. We have a leadership that understands that you cannot continue to do the same thing over and over again and expand and, ex and expect a different result. You know, we, we have some very creative, uh, proactive things that the OPP are doing, like a very simple, basic thing of adding more oil changes to our, our uh, fleet of, of cars that will allow them to last, stay on the, the road longer. You know, I, I have great faith in the leadership of the OPP to be able to manage these challenges within their existing allotment because they have done it and they understand that we need to bring Ontario's fiscal health. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. In addition to cutting over $46 million from the OPP's budget this year, the government is ripping over $35 million out of the correctional services. That means our correctional facilities will continue to experience dangerous levels of understaffing, putting correctional workers and inmates at risk. Why is the government refusing to listen to frontline correctional workers 
who say they can't afford to see any more cuts. Again, the Solicitor General. So let's be clear here, Speaker. Uh, later on this afternoon, my friend and colleague, the, uh, the minister and I will be making an announcement of another OPP yeah, detachment that is going to be opening in the province of Ontario. Yeah, yeah. We've already announced a new uh, facility in Thunder Bay. We have made uh, improvements in our corrections facilities where there is a body scanner in every single correction facility, bar one, in the province of Ontario. We are making changes that are actually improving the lives of the corrections officers and staff who work in our facilities, of the OPP officers who serve our communities so well, and we will continue to do that, but we will do it in a way that is fiscally prudent and, frankly, fiscally responsible, which has been far too lacking in the province of Ontario for the last 15 years. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. The minister recently tabled a comprehensive piece of legislation that, if passed, will bring much-needed change to Ontario's roads and highways. Many of the measures found in this piece of legislation will assist Ontarians by changing regulations to exempt individuals with personal trailers and pickup trucks from burdensome annual inspections and protecting frontline roadside maintenance, construction, tow truck and recovery workers from careless and dangerous drivers. My community of Thornhill is very pleased to hear of our proposed measures aimed at keeping our children safe by allowing a new administrative monetary penalty framework that gives municipalities the tools they need to target drivers who blow by school buses and threaten the yeah. safety of our children when they cross our roads. Yeah. Speaker, can the minister share more about the Getting Ontario Moving Act? Yeah. Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the member from Thornhill for that, uh, that great question. And as she has stated, our commitment to safety is reaffirmed in many of the proposed changes in the Getting Ontario Moving Act. In addition to the proposed changes the member outlined, we also want new drivers to know that it's never safe to drive under the influence. So we're introducing a new offence for any driving instructor who violates a zero blood alcohol or drug presence requirement. We're also focused on improving traffic flow and enhanced road safety on our highways by introducing tougher penalties for driving too slow in the left-hand lane. Additionally, we're looking to allow motorcyclists to use high occupancy vehicle lanes, which is a much safer part of the road for them. And Mr. Speaker, I have much more to share regarding safety in the next supplemental. Supplementary question. Thank you to the Minister of Transportation for that great response. The Getting Ontario Moving Act clearly has many measures that will increase the safety of our roads, highways and bridges while cutting red tape and reducing regulatory burdens for all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, no matter what the service, regulation, program or policy, we want to hear from Ontarians and put the experience of real people first. At the centre of our decision-making, we ask ourselves how the people of Ontario will benefit. The policy measures the Minister of Transportation is proposing will give long-needed relief to com commuters, help make our communities safer and make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. It's unfortunate that the NDP chose to vote against these measures in the first reading, but I'm confident that they've now read the bill and they'll be supporting it. I look forward to hearing more from the Minister of Trans uh, Transportation when he elaborates further on the proposals found in the Getting Ontario Moving Act. Supplementary response. Thanks again for that question, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I was puzzled last week or two weeks ago when I introduced my legislation and the opposition voted against it without even reading legislation, Mr. Speaker. It wasn't that long ago when we were in opposition and they were the third party that they used to uh, make fun and make talking points about our party about voting against the budgets that were disastrous to this, this, uh, this province without reading them. Mr. Speaker, what's changed over there with that, that uh, government over there? Are they against safety, Mr. Speaker? Are they against moving forward? Are they against reading legislation and working with uh, other parties and making Ontario a better place? Mr. Speaker, it's simply puzzling that they chose to go down that road. But second reading's around the corner, Mr. Speaker, and I hope they change their mind and, and join us in supporting this bill for safety. But, Mr. Speaker, this bill is not only about safety, it's about speaking with Ontarians. We're launching two province-wide consultations, one to review speed limits, which Response. announced last week, and another one to look at the rules around bicycles, e-bikes, and scooters. We want to make sure the road is safe for all users uh, on the roads and highways throughout this province, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to this consultation progress as process as we Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Since the election of the Premier in 2018, in June 2018, the Francophones have uh, uh, seen their rights being reduced. We lost uh, the Francophone University. We lost um, the Commissioner of French Language Services. We've also discovered that uh, hidden in uh, the budget, uh, in the uh, tr Treasury Council, that the budget of uh, Francophone Affairs will be reduced by 15 percent. When will Francophones in Ontario see the end of the cuts in Francophone services? I refer to the Minister of Francophone Affairs and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'd like to ask uh, the member opposite uh, to correct uh, her record. Maybe she's had uh, problems uh, following the numbers uh, that were in the estimates, but we, the changes in terms of the Minister of Francophone Affairs are on the administrative side and are lesser than what she mentioned. Uh, maybe uh, the NDP believed in the uh, uh, promises from the Liberal government uh, during the electoral campaign. The, these were empty promises, but we knew that uh, Ontarians didn't believe the Liberals and their empty promises. That's why we were elected with a uh, is strong mandate, and that's why we're here with over uh, 66 members to represent uh, uh, Ontarians, and we continue to promote the, the interest of Francophones in a sustainable manner, in a completely different manner than the former government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Francophone Affairs coordinates uh, the uh, Francophone services uh, throughout uh, the government. This affects all interactions uh, between the government and Francophones. During the last uh, summer, this government wasn't even able to coordinate the modifications uh, for French language services in the community of the French River. It, we would have thought that this would have been very obvious in that area, but it wasn't. Given its bad reputation with Francophones, why is the Premier, why does he believe that uh, French language services can continue to be reduced? To the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Minister of Francophone Affairs, I'm working very closely with the Premier in order to improve uh, French language services, uh, to have better access to uh, frontline services in French, and to protect uh, the ac acquired rights by the Francophone community. Uh, also, we are focusing on creating jobs for Francophones in this province. Uh, we have offered in our budget uh, a, an extension of LACFO in terms of organizations that have access to funding from the government. We've also uh, implemented uh, legislative changes that will allow uh, Caisse Populaires and credit unions to participate uh, in um, the program to federal banks. And also as uh, Attorney General, there's an action plan to improve uh, access to justice in Sudbury. Our government, Mr. Speaker, is working in order to improve access and we continue to work on this. Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, Ontario Government for the People was elected with the mandate to improve public safety across this province and to provide the brave men and women of our police services with the tools and resources they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. This week is a police week that focuses on raising awareness and recognition of the great work of our police services in keeping our community safe. Mr. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain to this House how our government for the people is supporting the brave men and women in the uniform of our police services in Ontario? Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Markham Unionville.
you know, he's blessed in York Region to have an excellent uh, service led by uh, Chief Joliffe. So I understand, I know that you uh, appreciate and understand how important it is that we support and mark Police Week across the province. We believe it's important that we take time to collectively acknowledge and honour the work police personnel do each and every day. You know, their dedication to their profession is outstanding, and their contribution to our society is invaluable. We owe them our gratitude. You know, since being elected in June of last year, we have shown that in very clear ways by uh, making changes so that police officers who use naloxone to save a life were actually not going to be under an unnecessary SIU investigation. Here, here. We made changes to the Police Services Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act to ensure Response. that we had achieved the appropriate balance between um, integrity with our police and uh, and transparency with their operations. You know, we uh, we go, we will continue to do more. But this thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Solicitor General for her response. Ontario is a home to some of the finest police officers anywhere in the world. It is an honor to be part of our government that recognizes the contribution to our communities and is willing to stand up for frontline police officers. Mr. Speaker, our communities are more safe when the police the people and their government are empowered to work together. Mr. Speaker, I could ask the Solicitor General, please share more about how our government is supporting the police and public safety in Ontario. Minister. Thank you. you know, I, I couldn't agree more with the uh, member from Markham Unionville. Public safety is and always will be a priority for our government. Our commitment to provide our frontline police officers with the resources, equipment, and supports they need to protect our citizens is unwavering. It's uh, very exciting that uh, within a few hours I will be making an announcement with the, uh, my friend and colleague, the Minister of Infrastructure, to open a, a groundbreaking for an additional OPP detachment. to give the people, uh, the police, the, the resources and the tools they need to keep our communities safe because at the end of the day, that is uh, one of our most sincere priorities as a government. We will continue to do that. And as we mark Police Week, I hope that members from all sides of this House take the opportunity to engage in a Response. conversation with their police and their chiefs and understand the important value that they play in our communities. It is critical that we acknowledge this work, and I appreciate uh, the work that they they are doing. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A devastating six-alarm fire broke out at York Memorial Collegiate Institute in my riding of York Southwestern last Tuesday. For 92 years, York Memorial has served as a pillar of the Kilston community as a tribute to the city of York's fallen soldiers. York Memorial offered specialized programs to hundreds of students across York Southwestern and beyond, including advanced placements courses and the RUSH program. The Killstown community is concerned about both the immediate needs of the youth and businesses owned affected by this fire, as well as the long-term future of York Memorial as a historic structure and community hub. The York Memorial of uh, the, the people of my riding, Mr. Speaker, want assurances from this government that their school will be rebuilt. Will the Premier commit to rebuilding York Memorial Collegiate, yes or no? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. And to the member opposite, absolutely we're committed to working with the school board to make sure that your, that community hub, if you will, is absolutely restored because uh, coming back from Skills Ontario last uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday morning when it was on fire again, we actually drove by and it's a heartbreak what has happened to that community. I understand it's under investigation and uh, we certainly will be working with the school board and I look forward to working with you to make sure we get it right. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes question period for today. This House stands in recess. Oh, just a sec. There's a point of order. Member for Parkdale High Park. Thank That's you. How you do it. That's how you do it. Everybody should do it.
I'd like to welcome all members of the House to the 7th Annual Tibet Day Lunch Reception uh, in Room 230 that's hosted by various Tibetan organizations in, the, in Ontario. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The House stands in recess until 1 p.m.